次じゃない。Good morning, everyone. Good to see you this morning. Welcome, Community Church, to this time of worship and praise of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here at Community Church, we are here to glorify God and enjoy Him forever by loving Him, by loving one another, and by loving our neighbors. And God has called us to this great calling、uh, through His Son, Jesus Christ, whom we celebrate. Through this season of Advent. And so, if you're here for the first time, welcome to、uh, joining in with us in our season of Advent. We are、uh, celebrating with the, the Advent candle, as you can see, and we light each candle each week to remind us of certain aspects that we see throughout Scripture. The first part being the awaiting of the prophets and the, and the promise from the prophets of who would come. This Messiah, this one to be born. Last week, we lit the candle of Bethlehem, in which we celebrated that moment where this, this, the family of Mary and Joseph are called together to believe God and trust Him that Messiah was coming through Mary's virgin womb. And now,、uh, today, we celebrate the shepherds and、uh, what was proclaimed to them on the hilltops. There in, in lowly Bethlehem, these lowly shepherds received the greatest news of human history God coming down to be with mankind. And so we celebrate this by lighting the candles, by prayers, and also by songs. But the focus of our attention is upon this time. I want to give you a, just a, a heads up reminder that during this season, we are having Christmas is Sunday morning, all right? Christmas is Sunday morning, and、uh, as we join together, we're rolling things back an hour, so we'll be meeting at 10 30 on Sunday morning. Now, some people might have had a question. They see,、uh, they see in the announcements here that there's an elder blessing. Oh, what does that mean? That sounds so strange and unusual. It's not the way I was ever brought up. Well, it's a tradition within this church to have an opportunity to.、Uh, to Actually, just come up and pray with, with、uh, an elder or a group of elders. And we just want to be able to pray a blessing over you in the new year, pray for any、uh, prayer concerns or anything that you have on your heart. And I want to, know, want to let you know how the elders have already been preparing for this. Yesterday, we spent、uh, well over four hours. Just going through and praying for each and every one of you and just lifting you up. So, we want to know how we can pray for you. Those moments and that time that we'll have together, we'll take communion again together、uh, as, a, as a, a service together and, and rejoicing in the Lord and that sacrament. And then we will have an opportunity. You'll, you'll have an opportunity to walk up here. We'll have different stations with, with elders to just come up there and just quietly pray with them. Share what's on your heart, any prayer requests and needs, and just ask for ble that blessing、uh, from the Lord. And so we will be praying for you in that way. So look forward to that. That is, that is part of our, our service next week. We'll sing some songs. You'll hear、um, some from the Word of God as well. So we'll be doing all that during our time next week. All right? So if that maybe gives you some ease if you look at that and you go, I've never been to an elder blessing service. Now you have, and now you will when you join us next week. All right, we look forward to that time. Well, let's begin our time of worship and praise by bowing our heads and preparing our hearts for this time. Father, thank you. Thank you that we can gather in the name of Jesus Christ because of what you have done through your Son. We pray right now, Lord, that you would set aside things that would distract us, things that would draw our attention away from you. Maybe even heart attitudes of why we're even here, or how we got here, or the different things that we encountered even getting here, or how this, even this day went or this week went, Lord. Set those things aside. I am here. We are here to give you praise. So, Lord God, may you receive all the honor due your name. May you be high and lifted up in our hearts. And may everything that we do in this time be for your glory. And may you, O、oh、God, as you observe this time of worship, would you be pleased and it would be a savoring、uh, scent to you that you would receive it with joy and with great, great appreciation for your, the love that your people have for you. 
We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, church. Morning. I remember student teaching years ago at a little parochial school right down the street from my house, which was very convenient. And they had a, a time for, I think it was Advent, and the children were supposed to um, do some type of artwork to emphasize the coming of the Lord. And there was one little girl in the or in the fourth grade, I taught fourth and fifth, and she lay down on the floor, lay, lay back, and someone drew her shape, and I was curious what she'd be doing with that, and she put in bold letters, we are the church. It's not the building, it's not the clergy, it's not this or that, we are the church. And this morning as we open this service, we're using two songs uh, by our uh, dear brother Eric Rose, and the poetry in this is uh, very rich, and poetry for me is, is, is not a picture that looks exactly the way I'm looking at um, Jackie here. There's more to it, there's symbolism in it. So if you don't know the text, allow the, uh, or the, the tune, just join us when you can, but really engage in the text, the poetry of this, of the coming of the Lord, and like last week, we had the tree of, uh, of life. We had the candles reminding us of the coming of the Lord, the singing and so forth. This is another element in this poetry. So we'll remain seated for this point, and let's try to sing for you from God's love.
Merry Christmas. Let's hear the reading of the word of God from Luke chapter 2, verse 25 through 35. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed. And a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. May the Lord God bless his word. Let's pray. Father, as we once again enjoy this Advent season, this third Sunday of Advent, remembering as we do the long-awaited hope of your faithful people throughout history, Lord, you are always faithful to your word. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies we see. We thank you, Lord, for this promise and for its fulfillment, and we invite you into our our house today, that we may bring honor and glory to your name. Through Jesus we pray, amen. Christ is the joy and happiness of all who look forward to his coming. Let us call upon him and say, Come, Lord, we do not delay. In joy we wait for your coming. Come, Lord Jesus. Before time began, you shared life with the Father. Come now and save us. You created the world and all who live in it. Come to redeem the work of your hands. You did not hesitate to become man, subject to death. Come to free us from the power of death. You came to give us life to the full. Come to give us your unending life. You desire all people to live in love in your kingdom. Come and bring together those who long to see you face to face. Today we light three candles. The first reminds us of our need for a savior. The second reminds us of the promises in God's word. The third reminds us that Jesus is coming soon and we must abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. O key of David, Jesus Christ, the gates of heaven open at your command. Come and show us the way to salvation. Declaring what we believe through the scriptures, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Let the
Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice and let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all your upright in heart. May all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say evermore, God is great. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, and give thanks to his holy name. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We are waiting for him, that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation.
Sign up kids for our lesson today and any uh, adults that like to join us as we um, continue our series on Advent. Good morning. Well, as you folks know, we've been talking about the, the unexpected trees of Christmas. We, of course, always uh, celebrate Christmas. We have Christmas trees with lights and ornaments. And, and, uh, and what's the most fun thing under the Christmas tree? Who can tell me? Yeah? Presents, that's right. We love to have the presents under the Christmas tree. Now, what we've been talking about, though, at this Advent season is the very first two trees that are significant in the Christmas story. This is God's story of Christmas, and it didn't begin with pine trees. It began with the two trees in the Garden of Eden that we talked about, and I moved them over there. But the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was a tree God put in the garden and said, you must not eat from this tree. Because if you do, you will surely die. Now last week we talked about who showed up in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, or at least around the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And, um, and who was that? That unexpected visitor in the tree, yeah. Satan. That's right, the snake. Satan dressed up like a serpent in order to trick and tempt Eve into disobeying God. And that's exactly what she did, didn't she? But there was other trees in the garden, and God had told them they could eat from any of those. In fact, there was one tree in particular, we don't talk about it enough, but I had it up here last week, and that's the tree of life, all right? The tree of life. And the tree of life was a tree that were, they were to eat from. And in, if they ate from that tree, they would have everlasting life. So God had given them not only two trees, but those were like presents. And, uh, and so the question I've asked you over the weeks is, what do you want most at Christmas? All right. So now, this morning, if you noticed, under the tree over there, was there's a big, big present, isn't there? Mr. Joey, would you, uh, oh, maybe you, could you and, oh, you can't, you're bu you got a bum shoulder, don't you? We need that over here, and I probably shouldn't do that today, so if you would uh, set that big present right up there. Whoa, now how many would like to get a present like that under your Christmas tree, right? Because the bigger, the better. Yeah. All right. So let's um, let's just see. Now this is a present that God put. Now I'm just kind of imagining that it was wrapped up. Uh, it's it probably wasn't in the Garden of Eden, but we're just going to pretend that God wrapped it up in a pretty bow and said, "I want you to eat from this. I want you to choose this present, not the present that Eve ended up choosing." Who, uh, how, how many of you like to rip open your presents? Would you rather rip it or would you rather fold it gently? You're a gentler? All right, well, I'm kind of halfway in between. So we're going to just rip it open, all right? Rip this present open and see what it is that God gave Adam and Eve in this present. Oh, now you got all these extra wrappings, don't you, in the presents? Oh, now look at this. Isn't that pretty? All right, this is our Christmas lamb. Now, there's a place in the Bible that talks about lambs, and there's a very important way that the lamb is described. He is called the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The most incredible thing about Christmas for us to remember is that Jesus was born as the gift of the Heavenly Father to us to 
conquer the devil, remember? Stomp on the head of the serpent and crush him, and also to give us his own son, the Lamb of God. And so that was kind of the most important present. That really was the most important present that God had to give. Now, he didn't show him the lamb back then in the garden. He talked about him, though. God told them that he would one day send a deliverer to stomp on the head of the serpent and to give them victory over sin. That's the greatest gift that we have this Christmas. You're going to have lots of fun presents. I'm sure you've got lots of things that you asked for at Christmas. But like I said, the, what is the most important thing that God can give us at Christmas? And that is Jesus himself. Let's pray. Would you stand up with me? Father, I thank you for the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I thank you, Lord, for the way you have supplied every need that we had and that you have given us eternal life through your son Jesus. Lord, our prayer for these kids, our prayer for this church is that we would celebrate this Advent with that full appreciation and awareness of the great gift of eternal life. So Lord, I pray that you would engrave the truths of Advent upon the hearts of these children, even as they go open their presents on Christmas morning and and have all their uh, expectations and wishes of play. Lord, may the truth of Christmas, the truth of the Advent, never be far from their memories, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Need to pray together. What a what a joyful sight uh, to not only see the children before us, but to see the gift that God has given us, His Son Jesus Christ. Let's praise Him right now in prayer. Lord, we praise You. We thank You. We give You glory, and we just are so appreciative for the gift and the promise that was in the garden, that was fulfilled through Jesus Christ. The one who came and crushed the serpent by undoing what was done in the garden, by bringing back to life that which had only seen death. And Lord, that's us. We come right now before you acknowledging our brokenness and our sin. And if it was not for your son and belief in him and trust in him, that He paid for that sin upon the cross for us as a substitution. If it wasn't for that fact, Lord, we would still be in sin. And if it wasn't even greater still that You rose again from the dead on the third day, and death could no longer hold You, for You had conquered it by the righteousness of Your Son, by the power and the obedience of Him unto the Father, and by fulfilling all that God had commanded, proving that death had been put to death forever, and that sin had been paid for by rising again and giving us that everlasting hope. We thank You, Lord Jesus, for the greatest gift, Yourself. We pray, Lord, that today, in this time as we worship You, as we serve You, that You would not only make Yourself more real to us in our lives, but that You would reveal to us through Your Word how we are to live for You. How we are to traverse this world that is passing away and looking towards the citizenship and the kingdom that is to come in Your presence forever. Lord, lead us and guide us in that way because that's where we struggle. You've taken care of our sin problem, but Lord, we still struggle with our various sins throughout our life and you're doing a work in us to sanctify us, to get rid of that. And one day in your presence, that will all be gone. We look forward to that day. But until then, Lord, help us as we traverse, as we traverse this world 
as we go through these trials and tribulations, as we have many people sick even right now, Lord, we lift them up to you. We pray for them as they're dealing with uh, COVID or RSV. We have children that are sick with the flu. We have moms that are sick. Lord, we lift them up to you. We have individuals at home even watching us right now, Lord, and we're praying for them and we're lifting them right up. And we trust in you because you do magnificent things. We thank you, Lord God, even for surgeries like Nolan had, even this week, Lord, that allows uh, bones to be reset in place and that by your hand, Lord, you've given such wisdom to doctors, but it is you and you alone who heals us. And I just want to rejoice, Lord, in healings that have taken place in this past few years and weeks, even proclamation of those who are struggling with cancer, Lord, that you have undone. Those who are going through those trials and those tribulations, give them strength in these moments, Lord. Give them peace. For those who are suffering financially, emotionally, physically. For those who are suffering spiritually, Lord, be with them and encourage them and strengthen them. And may we together as the body of Christ see them in their infirmities, whatever they may be, and come alongside and lift them up in the name of Jesus. Lord God, we pray that you would bless us as we give our tithes and our offerings today out of a maturity of our heart to trust you and to give unto you as you receive those gifts in the basket, Lord, those tithes. We pray that you would use them for your kingdom and for your purposes. And Father, we thank you that we can work together with uh, with missionaries abroad, and even those who are in our backyard. We pray right now for Randy and Barb Brown at Military Avenue. We even right now, Lord, as we collect up gifts for certain children there, we pray blessings on those gifts. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to have brought food over there and fed 100 folks or 100 families with meals, Lord God. We thank you for the VBS that happened this past year to be able to reach those children in that area for the gospel. We thank you for the Browns, Lord, and what they're going through. But they've had a hard year, Lord. They've had thefts. They've had people breaking in. They've had people steal their air conditioners, Lord. So we lift them up to you. We pray for them and the vandalism and all those things. Put a hedge of protection around them. Watch over them and keep them, Lord. They are so faithful. You talk to them and they're smiling even as they're going through trials. And Lord God, give us that joy. That joy to endure in all things as we lift them up and pray for them. We thank you for this time. Draw us near to a time of worship and praise as we focus on your word. May you, O God, speak to us through it. May my words fall short and yours be lifted up. And may you, O Lord, change us by the truth of your word spoken today. In Jesus' name, amen. Scriptures tell us that uh, the shepherds visited uh, Mary and Joseph and the child. And what did they do when they left? They went home and shared what had happened to them, and really spreading the gospel. We get a chance to do that with a very familiar tune and and text. Stand together as we go tell it on the mountains.
clapping would have been appropriate thing in that, and a tam tambourine. Good morning, church. Good to see all of you this morning, to see some new faces, uh, to see those who have been joining us, and uh, to see the faithful. Uh, Lord God, is, uh, He is good in all of His ways. We, what we're going through in a series together through Advent is looking at the, the moments in which we see the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. We see the 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 effects of the gospel within the manger story, within the nativity. And we're trying to understand these little elements, these little glimpses of what the gospel and sharing the truth of who Jesus is would be for us as believers. Last week we dealt with adoption and how we're adopted into the family of God and this great adoption of God. And before that, we dealt with the prophecies and the promise of the one that is to come. And this time, as we look at the shepherds up on the hill, as we look at Luke chapter 2, and we get this depiction of the lowly shepherds up in the same region, we see this beautiful scene of the angels coming, proclaiming the truth of God come incarnate. And we see also now these shepherds receiving this news. Part of this proclamation and the idea of the gospel, uh, when we think about the gospel, how many of us inevitably think about sharing it? When you hear the word evangelism or you hear the word gospel, you think that has to be something that is shared, right? Right? That has to be something that's proclaimed. There's a proclamation that has to take place. Romans chapter 10, verse 14 says very clearly that if we are not, uh, if we're not sharing it, if we're not proclaiming it, in fact, let me, let me read this to you so we get the idea when we are dealing with the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ, this is what often comes to our minds. How then... Will they call on Him who they have not believed? And how are they to believe in Him who they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? The idea is that we are sent. We are sent to proclaim Him. We're sent to share this good news, this gospel. We know this. So how does that work in the story of the nativity. How does that work in the story of Bethlehem on that silent night? Well, like many of you, you might think, okay, when it comes to the gospel, I'm a little scared. I'm a little scared to proclaim it. I'm a little scared to share it. I'm, I, I'm a little nervous about that. Maybe it's because I'm afraid of somebody else's opinion of me. Maybe it's because uh, I'm worried that they'll argue some theological point with me. Maybe I'm just uh, concerned because I'm, I'm, I'm afraid that they'll even reject me in this sense. Anybody ever feel that way? I know I've had a hard time. There's times where I've shared the gospel with uh, my family. And there's, uh, there's times where... Boy, it, it was received well, and I'm like, Lord, this is going good. The, 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 the questions are there, the answers are there, and then it goes another direction. And it's just kind of left behind. Maybe it's even an opportunity when you see somebody to speak to them, and, and you know that you've met, and you've kind of hinted at a relationship with Christ, and you've kind of talked about it a little bit, but then to go to that place where now, okay, Lord, I'm going to share with them today, this is the truth about Jesus but there's that trepidation. There's that fear. Many times when we look at this uh, story, this beautiful story here in verse 8, look at this together as we look. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were filled with great fear. 
we identify more in this story when it comes to sharing the gospel with the shepherds than we do with the angels, do we? Here they come, the angels who have been waiting since the foundations of the earth to be able to proclaim this good news of this mystery that God has now unfurled on humanity. These angels that see him in all of his glorious presence and they have now been given orders, go. Go and tell them that Messiah has come. The one that they've been waiting for since the garden. The one that has been the promise to come. He has come. You think the angels were excited? Oh yeah. That angel that proclaims is in great power. And notice it says the glory of the Lord, the doxa of the Lord. That same word is kabod in, uh, in Hebrew. And it, and it means his, his visible presence, God's visible presence was there with them. Not just shiny uh, angels, but God's glory was there with the, with the shepherds. Who do we identify with? when we go to share the gospel. Are we like the angels? I've got to tell you about Jesus with great power and authority and just such joy, here I am. Is that us? Or are we a little bit more like the shepherds? Oh, oh boy. Oh, I've got to talk about the Lord. Okay, I've got to work up to this. Okay, and, and we're working through points in our head. Maybe we're trying to go down the Roman road. Maybe we're trying to think of all these different things. But what I want to point out here today is that in this proclamation, this moment in which there is these angels, there's these shepherds, who are we looking at together? We're not looking at the angels. We're looking at the shepherds. Because they give us a hint of what it means for us to share the gospel. And we can learn from them in this moment. We can see some important things about who they are and about how to share and our attitude of sharing the gospel. Look at their initial reaction to seeing this great and amazing thing by God. They're afraid. And quite naturally, anybody who sees the majestic power of, of angels come into their presence and the glory of the Lord shine around them. By the way, this is the same kind of wor wording that is used in the Septuagint, which is the, the, the um, Latin translation of the Hebrew. The same kind of word is used in this, or not Latin, the Greek translation of the Hebrew is used in the same way at Mount Sinai. So what's happening on this, this field, though we often imagine it to be uh, um, something that is, that is uh, grand, it is even grander than we can fathom. And what I want us to focus on here is just what God is doing with these shepherds. Look at how they're ironic eyewitnesses, these guys. Because we have to understand the culture in that time and that these shepherds, they were, they were really looked over by humanity. They were really looked over by, by culture, and, and they were actually treated uh, sociologically like slaves, and sorry ladies, like women in that day. Their testimony did not stand up in court. They were considered liars. They were considered thieves just because they were shepherds. It kind of shows you the sociological structure. Here they are actually serving the community by watching over these sheep, and yet they're disdained in many ways. So it's like ironic that God would choose them of all people for the angels to come and proclaim the greatest news in human history. God has come down and taken on flesh, and he is among us. And who are you going to tell in those kind of circumstances? Well, you're going to tell the rich, right? You're going to tell the people that can get the story out, and it'll go far and abroad. You're going to, you're going to tell those who are in powerful, influential places. You're going, to, you're going to get the movers and the shakers. If they had Twitter, they'd be putting it on Twitter. But who do they go to? Who are they sent to? to by the Lord because these men had been forgotten by the rest of men they had been ignored 
And I want us to understand this because we identify more with these shepherds than we ever know. In many ways, because of our sin, we have been distanced from God. Maybe even in our lives, we've been distanced from men and, and we feel ignored and we feel displaced. But God Himself is the one who called. Oops, sorry. Is the one who called them. He called out to them through the angels. Look at verse 10. And the angels said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. That very proclamation, what joy, what hope has been waiting for ages. Isaiah said in his proclamation, as as the Lord filled him with the Spirit, he says, for unto us a child is what? Born. What do they say? that That's the waiting at that moment. But what do the angels say? He has been born today. This has happened now. You are living in the present of the gospel, the good news. Brothers and sisters, God chose these ignored men that couldn't even stand up in court to give a testimony. He chose them to be eyewitnesses to the greatest thing in human history. I just want us to soak that in for a moment. When you're afraid and you're nervous, just remember that God chose the shepherds to be the first guys on earth to be able to see what He is doing and what He has done. That Shekinah glory that shone all around them, the fear that enveloped them, this proclamation of everything that all of the Jewish nation has been waiting for for ages and ages is taking place today. And the Savior who comes from King David, He is here. Oh, the hope that must have been the the shock and awe. Don't you wish that if we were sharing the gospel, we had the shock and the awe of angels when we came to them? I'm just coming to you with shock and awe, just glory all around. Let me tell you about Jesus. And people are like, yes! But what I love about this story is given the bright lights and the shock, we've got some Dirty, smelly men on a hill watching over sheep. And you know what? That's the greatest joy of all. Is they're the ones that the message is for. You and I, brothers and sisters, are the ones that the message are for. Us and our brokenness. And he said even this, and he goes on in verse 12, And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and laying in a manger. I don't know why it's double clicking on me there. Look at this. This sign is meant for them. Not for the rest of humankind, but for these men on a hill. And it's a particular sign. And what is this particular sign? You will find a child wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in what? A feeding trough. For guys who spend their whole life with feeding troughs. For guys who are even probably, and this is by many commentaries, they're, they're watching over in the time of, of, of early spring, they're watching over even the Passover lambs. Bethlehem's not very far from Jerusalem where the, Bethle- where the, where the Passover lambs would be slain. There's a lot of speculation that these shepherds are probably even watching over those very lambs. Those lambs that will be given for, for, for slaughter in the, in the celebration of what God did thousands of years ago, bringing His people out of Egypt and giving them this Passover. They would slay the lamb and they would eat of the lamb and the blood of the lamb would go on the lintels of their doors. So that night as God passed over in judgment, taking the firstborn of every family except those who had the blood of the lamb covering their home, His judgment would pass over them. 
and his mercy would be upon them. And that celebration, these men probably watching over these very lambs that will symbolize that yet again, to them is given this idea, a sign will be for you. And this is where I take this very personally. Maybe this is not where some people would go with this, but I take this very personally in that God was saying to them as shepherds. Why? Because often when these little lambs were born in that time and they wanted to make sure that they were protected from blemishes and things, you know what they would do to these little lambs right when they're born? They would wrap them up in swaddling. And you know where they would often lay them? In that place where there's the feeding trough. So they wouldn't get bumped around or jostled or injured. So they, they would be perfect lambs for that sacrifice. This will be a sign unto you. You're going to see a child laying in the same way that you lay those little lambs. You can't mistake it. It won't just be up in, in some area where you, you hear a mother and you hear a child up, up in the upper balconies of somebody's house. That won't be the child. This child will be lowly like you. He will be met in the same area of what you're doing in the stinky barn, in a place of maybe a cave, whatever it might have been, we can imagine in those areas, and don't get me started on architecture of uh, ancient Palestine because I still believe it was partly in a home, but that's me. We'll get into that another time. You guys can send me all sorts of emails about it. This idea, though, of these ironic eyewitnesses, men that couldn't even defend what they're seeing or even this sign that they've been given. But you and I, brothers and sisters, we're the shepherds too. Talk about ironic eyewitnesses to what God has done in our lives through His Son, Jesus Christ. Talk about people that really were broken by our sin. Who are we that God would have chosen us? Who are we that God would pay attention to us or share this truth of His Son to us? We're just like the shepherds. And so in identifying like the shepherds, we have to understand that they were humble heralds. These were some humble guys. They were up on this hill just doing their, their daily routine and God intervened in their life to change it forever to give them a message that would change all of human history, that to, would last even to 2,000 years later, that I would be even preaching it to you and talking about these guys. This is so important for us to understand that we too are these shepherds, that God has given us this very message through about His Son, Jesus Christ, that He has come that he was a real person, historically, uh, historically documented by many other than just those in the biblical accounts. That he lived a life obedient to the Father, fulfilling all that God desired, being the perfect man. He did not sin. And by being our perfect substitute, he died upon the cross for us. We are those humble heralds of this good news. Because who would ever pick, who would ever pick us to be the ones to proclaim it? Now, I, I'm, I'm just speaking for myself. I'm not judging everybody here. But we're not the best looking folks. Like, we're not powerful. We're not influential. We don't, we don't have the world uh, just waiting on what we're going to uh, post every moment and, and they can't wait to see what we're going to wear when we go walking out the door. We're just simple folks living in Owasso and Corona and Ovid and, and, and we're, just, we're here just serving the Lord. And, and some of us, you might have even just dealt with a season of work in the land. You might have really understood what the, what the shepherds have been going through. They had a very uh, they had a very Hum, uh, honorable past, if we think about it biblically. I mean, these guys were considered part of the patriarchs, and most of the patriarchs were shepherds as well. It comes from a very uh, noble past in that King David himself was a shepherd. But once, uh, once the influences of those who were 
who were farmers and not necessarily nomads, and they were settled down, they started to really look down at these shepherds. The Egyptians began this very clearly. They had no regard for shepherds at all. They thought it was a disdainful activity. And then the Romans continued that into Jesus' time. They, they thought that that was lowly, and it shows in the fact that they can't even proclaim anything in court. And yet these humble men, in this very moment, what is their attitude? Well, they say this, verse 15, and when the angels... Oh, wait, let me, let me back up to 13. And suddenly there was with the angels a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying... Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those whom He is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And here's the key. And they went with what? Haste. Haste. The night had gotten dark again. The the glory was gone. But the one thing that remained was the truth of what was in their heart and to understand and to be able to see. Let's see this. Is this really true? Could this be the moment? These humble men running down. In many ways, it just reflects to me in 2 Corinthians, we read this. For God has said, let light shine out of darkness, made His light to shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's 2 Corinthians 4. That starts at verse 6. Now to verse 7. Now we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this, surpass, uh, this surpassingly great power is from God and not from us. So what is this treasure? What is this treasure that's hidden in in jars of clay? And we are, by the way, the jars of clay. As he talks about this, he says, we have this great and wonderful news. We have this treasure. And what does it put in? God doesn't put it in some uh, elaborate, beautiful, ornate lockbox. What does he put this treasure in, this treasure that is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news that saves us, the only treasure of heaven? What is it? It's Jesus. And it's put in us. We're the jars of clay. Although, I don't know about you, but I I don't feel so much like a jar of clay. I feel more like this guy. Because in reality, I mean, we're mud people. (laughs) I mean, let's just be humble about this. Like, we're broken. We have fears. We have worries, especially when it comes to proclaiming the truth of Christ. We feel more like this when you see like, oh boy, I feel the Spirit kind of prompting me. Here's the opportunity. The person says, boy, I've been suffering through these these agonizing things in my life and I wish there was an answer. And you're going, okay, I feel like mud. I feel like that weak jar of clay and there's a great treasure that just wants to explode out. But Lord, I'm weak. What do we do? Let's look to the shepherds. What did they do that night? Well, first they went with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. And then verse 17. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told to them concerning this child. Take a moment to digest that. These men become praising proclaimers. And the first thing they do is they see with their own eyes the truth of what has been revealed to them, been given to them by someone who told them, okay, granted it was an angel and Shekinah glory. Okay, that's a pretty impressive thing. But now is the reality where the rubber hits the road. Sometimes maybe I'm thinking about when when I was a young teen and I would go up to, uh, to the, the camps that were up in the hills. You know, we have Barakel here. And how many people have gone to Barakel, by the way? 
Oh yeah, okay, like half the congregations been to Barakal or have worked there. And, and up in those places, you have a time with the Lord and you're singing songs and you're away and you see His glory all around you and you have this amazing experience and you draw close to God and you're like, wow, this is amazing. But then you know what happens when those teens usually get down from the hill? It's kind of left up on the hill, right? And it doesn't really follow with you down into the highways and byways and going to school the next day or sitting down and, and dealing with your parents again or, or that bully or whatever it might be, all of that was left behind. What didn't happen here in the shepherds? They let that truth stay with them. And they brought it in then that moment when they eyewitness this, they say forth to Mary and to everybody else that will hear them, they start telling them of what they've seen. Now, could you believe this? These guys can't bear witness in court. And they're telling tales about angels appearing and the whole army of God around them chanting glory to God. All about this child who's laying there in a, in a feeding trough wrapped up in torn up strips of cloth. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned doing a couple things here. And I want us to consider this. And this is really where we can gain some help from the shepherds. The first thing is they, they were filled with boldness. They had boldness as they came in verse 17 and they proclaimed everything that they saw. Here was the child. Here was the evidence. Here was the moment in which Jesus needed to be celebrated and what God had revealed to them and showed them to be absolutely true by His Word through the angels. They proclaimed. They were bold. And we're encouraged to be bold like this. I think, of, uh, I think of Peter and I think of John in the, book of, uh, in, in the book of Acts. And after they were told by the Sanhedrin, don't be proclaiming in this, in this Jesus' name after they just healed the man and they were just told, like, don't do this. What does the Scripture tell us in Acts chapter 4? Filled with boldness... What did they begin to do? Proclaim the word of God. There was a boldness that came forth from the gift of the Spirit to them to proclaim what is true. And so what we look at in this moment with the, with the shepherds, I want you to take heart as believers, though we are just weak vessels, we're just mud people. We have a treasure to proclaim that is not about us. So get us out of the equation. Let's talk about the treasure. Let's talk about Jesus Christ, the one and only Son of God. Let's talk about what He has done and who He is and what He offers to those who would believe in Him. And that salvation and that salvation alone is our hope. The fact that He has chosen us. Why has He chosen us? Who are we? You know that God planned all of human history for those particular shepherds to be sitting on that particular hill at that particular moment? How do we know? Because He sent His angels to them. Not to anyone else, but to them. We don't even know their names. But these guys are famous. These guys have been touched by the Lord who chose them to be the first eyewitnesses of the good news the euangelion. In fact, it says that the, that the angels were proclaiming the good news. That word that they use is the very same word that we use for evangelism. They said, we have, we have the good news evangelism for you. We have this, this wonderful thing that's going to change everything. And it changed them for certain. So they went forth with boldness. And we're told in, Peter, in 1 Peter 3, 14 through 16, this. But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, consider Christ Jesus. But in your hearts, consider Christ Jesus as holy, 
always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks for the reason for the hope that is within you. And do this with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that you are not so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. Acts chapter 4, verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished and they recognized that they had been with who? Jesus. See, we too are to be bold and this may be, brothers and sisters, probably the hardest part for us. Boldness. I'm not talking about Today, let's all march down to Owasso and start sharing the gospel with people on the street. That would be awesome. But I'll tell you, and I'll just be quite honest, I don't feel comfortable with that. I'll just be really open with you guys. I was part of Campus Crusade. It's now called Crew. They would train us and prepare us and say, okay, we're going to go out on the campus and just talk to some random stranger about Jesus. And I I did that. I did that quite a few times. And I never felt comfortable with it, and I never saw success, but that's me. Some people have this gift, and, they, and you know them. They'll spend five minutes with somebody, and they'll be able to tell you the whole, whole human history of this person. They'll, they'll be their best friend, and they've already exchanged phone numbers. And they've also told them about the Lord. And I look at these people, and I'm like, how do you do that? How do you just have this connection and the door just opens up? That's a gift from the Spirit. You know where I've seen the Lord really work for my heart in boldness? Is in those quiet times with my friends, my family, and my neighbors. Just those three, just put those three areas in your life, your friends, your family, and your neighbors. Can you guys think of people to reach out to in those areas? Can you? And even just friends? Yeah, I can think of them. Family? Oh, yeah. Neighbors, possibly, maybe I need to get to know them more. In those areas, can we just be bold in those three areas? Can we just share and just realize, let's, let's be honest, we're just broken vessels of clay, but we have a treasure that is Christ Jesus. And this is the, the part that I think we all tend to forget and something that we, that we can identify with in in seeing the shepherds do this, but I don't think that we always do this. Look at verse 20. And the shepherds returned, doing what? Glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. What were they doing? They were doing this with boldness and also with what? With joyfulness. With just utter joy. Before I said, oh boy, i got to share the gospel. Oh boy. What was lacking in my heart? Joy. Maybe that causes me to have to take a step back and think about in my life, am I joyful for the salvation that God has brought me? Am I joyful that He has taken me from darkness into light? Am I joyful that he calls me a son whereas I was an enemy of him? What did I do to deserve that? The answer is nothing. It was purely out of his love for me. His love for you. And perhaps he's even calling you to that love today to believe in that and to trust in that. And there's our joy. To know that death never, never has a hold on us anymore. Yeah, this body might die, but guess what? The Spirit's going to keep on going. And guess what God has? A brand new one. And it is glorious. It is going to be everlasting. It is going to be like His. And it's going to be indestructible. What is death now to me? It's really the doorway to be with Christ. And that's a great joy. What can man do to me? What can the things that they say to me or, or how they can persecute me? Is that going to ruin me in some way? No. Not if I'm proclaiming Christ. If they're slandering me for proclaiming Christ, then glory to God. That's what they did to the very Son of God. 
who said, I and the Father are one. And what did the, all of those do around him? They gathered up rocks to kill him. Do we have joy in our salvation? Do we rejoice in the fact every day when we wake up and say, I've been forgiven. I've been redeemed. And he is with me forever. Brothers and sisters, I think boldness might be our our true trial to get over. But I think what is really lacking to push us over the edge is our joyfulness in the salvation that God has brought us. It might not have been angels on a hill with glory all around and and them chanting in, in powerful form echoing around the hills. But I can tell you what happened in you when Christ Jesus saved you was greater than the display of the angels in that moment. For He took one who was dead in their sins before Him and He brought them back to life through the sacrifice of His Son. There is greater rejoicing in heaven when one sinner turns from sin. That is our joy as well. So brothers and sisters, let us proclaim him with joy and with boldness. Let's be humble. Let's realize that we're we're really kind of ironic that we would be called to witness to this because we were rebels against him. We were thieves. We were were those who would turn against his moral law each and every day, and even now we struggle with it. So let's recognize that we're mud people. In fact, my my preaching professor often said, hey, by the way, when you get up there, remember that you're a mud person. Okay, so I'm just sharing with you what my professor always told us, to lift us up, right? You're a mud person. And the only thing you have is this beautiful gem. Just point to the gem and don't Say, don't even look at the mud. Look at Him. Look at Christ Jesus in all of His glory and His beauty. Look at Him and be in awe. Don't look at the mud. So brothers and sisters, mud people, let's proclaim the truth with joy, with boldness, with humility and gentleness. But let's do it because we love Him and we are his very vessels that he has made, he has chosen to put this great and beautiful treasure within. Let it pour out from you in everything you do in life. Let's pray. Father, we need help in this because even as we proclaim this, we also are worried that now we have to proclaim this. That your truth, which is inside all of those who believe, is just yearning to pour forth for all of those who need to hear the truth of the gospel. If they don't hear it, how will they be saved? If we don't proclaim it, how will they know? So Lord God, would you give us words upon our tongues Give us moments where we see quite clearly you are saying, let the glory out. Let the treasure come forth and show Jesus to this person right now. That they would know and believe by your hand, O God. And and that's your hand alone. We, We read that in John 3, that it is only by the Spirit that one is born again. Yet you use us, these broken vessels, to share forth this treasure. Why you would do that, Lord? It just shows you how powerful and how great you are. Thank you, Father, that you have used me in my life in moments where it was the worst ski trip in the world, things, cars breaking down, us getting hurt, uh, being scared off by roaches in the hotel, and yet in that night, my best friend came to Christ because of your hand and your hand alone. And many of us have those moments where we can recognize It was only by you because we are just simply people of clay. And we need you, O God, to to always bring forth your truth in power and by the work of your Spirit. Do that within us, Lord, by giving us boldness and joy. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Jesus, what a wonderful child. Stand together as we sing this short hymn song twice. Enjoy it. Rejoice. change that to, uh, to the rejoicing that the shepherds sing, to the rejoicing that you, his people, will have in proclaiming the good news to your friends, to your family, to your neighbors. Let the treasure out, all right? Don't worry that you are made of clay. God made you that way for his glory and for his truth, because the weaker we are, the greater he is. So receive now this benediction as we go from this place into our time of Sunday school and rejoicing in this Advent season. He is the King of glory. He is the Lord God Almighty. And by His hand and His hand alone are we set free from sin and death. For His Son Jesus Christ took upon Himself the punishment of us all. And by His stripes we are made new. To Him be glory and honor and praise and thanksgiving now and forever in the church and in the world. And may every tongue of every tribe of every nation proclaim that Jesus alone is Lord and Savior to the glory of the Father forever. Amen. God bless you, brothers.